as in in the creative paradigm, source would be the cause of all existence. Source is is bigger than three dimensional because three dimensional fits within the paradigm and framework of source energy. We are trying to understand in the three D world what four, fifth, six, seven, eighth, ninth dimensions look like, feel like, taste like, smell like. Well, we leave three dimensions, none of these things matter because everything, you are a body of knowledge when you're in your light body. You become a body of ignorance when you take on a human body. So your light body has to be so powerful that it keeps your heart pure while you learn how to navigate the obstacles of life on earth in the 3D. So you go from supreme knowledge of the God form of the inanimate self to becoming the ignorant child that can't take care of itself. And then you go through all of your life to end up to be a senile adult that can't take care of itself. Right? So we're looking at cycles. <clears throat> When you understand that everything is in cycles, then you know that eternal beings live these cycles in order to have something to do for eternity. So all of the creative um, aspects, the creator gods, what we call the feminine, divine feminine gender is the creative God. Acquiesce to the ruler gods to maintain the balance of the physical realm. When they fail, the creator gods have to come back into the physical form to recreate a new reality because the ruler gods made mistakes and ruined everything, disrupting the natural balance of nature within the paradigm of the human. So then the creator gods got to use, got to go over everything that they did for the last 20 years. 26,000 years or so and say, okay, none of this working. Start, reset, recalibrate, go back to the beginning. So when we talk about the beginning, every 26,000 years, we go back to the beginning and start all over. So it's like the Mayans, yeah. and like people talk about the Mayan calendar. From the Western perspective, they were kind of speaking like it's the end of the world. Now, a time, September 2012, I went over to Mexico to meet the Mayans and all that. And he just said, it's just a new beginning. It's just yeah, a new beginning, yeah, like, another cycle. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just like when they was Y2K. Y2K was the prerequisite to understand what it means to come to the end of the Mayan calendar. Because they came to the end of the date that was programmed into the computer. So what did the computer do? They expected the computer to glitch. But all they did was reset to zero okay. and kept performing as if nothing was wrong. Yeah. Same with the Mayan calendar. You know, so all of these cycles, once the more cycles you break out of the paradigm of, the more free you become. We are trapped in racism, sexism, gender bias, homophobia, uh, pedophilia, all of these opposing paradigms that don't serve us, but we let the society and the, the mainstream that believe they know more than the individual steer the individual to a path of his own destruction. We trying to keep up with the Joneses, but the Joneses is trying to find out who they is. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So when we realized this, we said, hold on, well, wait a minute. We don't have to keep up with the Joneses. We can do our own thing in our own lane, and we don't have to worry about what the Jones is doing in their lane, because if they swerve over here, we just going to bump them back to their lane. Right? And now that free you up to be a creative being within the 3D paradigm and manifest your best life. That's what we're here for. We are here to try to figure out how to manifest our best life. Yeah. That's because the, the manifestation of the best life is the accurate reading of the book of life. Now, you know, everybody you say, comes in mm, with a book of life. Now, when you see manifestation, manifesting, 
we see a lot of this new age stuff nowadays. And um, you know, you got books like The Secret, you've got you got a lot of new age kind of teachings where you see like books like The Secret, uh, things like that as in new age teachings, or it's actually compatible with the ancient indigenous knowledge. Um, so they never tell you in the secret because I read the book like six times. Like, well, they never told me what the secret was. Yeah, <laughs> good point. <laughs> Very good point. So the all of these the the keys to manifestation is the self realization and knowledge of self that's required for you to tap into your higher mindset. The human mind, the computer system, is based off the human mind. The RAM is your short-term memory. The hard drive is your long-term memory. And your infinite memory is the cloud. You have to fill up your hard drive, overrun your RAM in order to go straight to the cloud to get your information. When you get into the cloud, that's when people start calling you weird, strange. He's kind of awkward. He's not like the rest of us. There's something wrong with him. No, there's nothing wrong with them. It's everything right with them. It's just that everybody else got something wrong with them and they don't want to accept that reality. Yeah. So when they see the strange, the weird ones, the ones that's slightly off, that's a little bit outside of the paradigm that they've been given, they don't fit in the box. They can't put them in none of the boxes. I can't check that box. They don't apply. No. Yeah, he's some of that, but not all of that. But he's a little bit of this, but not all of this. So you you he don't fit in the box. Now the Agent Smith effect kicks in. You know, the people come out and lash out, come up against you. He don't know what he's talking about. He's crazy. He's psychotic. He's delusional. And all of the things to challenge your intellectual stability and to determine if you firmly rooted in reality or if you departed from reality that they call insanity. But if the whole world is insane, the same person look like the crazy one. Yeah, definitely. Now, um, interesting thing, uh, what I seen you speaking on last time, Credo Motwa, some of the knowledge the brother has. And um, I remember you mentioned about, because I was always interested in um, a man called David Icke. I remember you mentioned about him being sent over there to take his work and put it into the into a curriculum. Now, um, interest. I mean, I've gone to actually see this man live as well. And some things, like, I listened to him watching for, like, eight hours on the stage, nine hours or something like that. And, um, I, you know, you try to get as much as you can from someone. And, um, you know, we spoke about Credo Mutwa a lot, you know, we, like as if he was a student of his or something. But I don't know if he, if he got that far. So do you feel like he exaggerates? He puts a spin his own spin on the um, Credo Motois knowledge, would you say? Everybody that transfers information before the information is transferred have to adjust it to the paradigm that they can see. Right, okay. So no matter who you're getting it from, including me, we all put our personal spin on it. Because in order for us to be effective in communicating, it had to have something from us in order for another person to pick up on it in its full energy expression. Okay. So if, if, is David Ike uh, tailoring Credo Mutua's teachings to uh, what he was already teaching? Absolutely. But was it what he already teaching that far removed from Credo Mutua where he can't discover him after the fact and then use him for a reference that proves a point that he already made before? Yeah. You know, so every teacher is going to teach it in a way that they feel can get the information across to the most people to have the biggest effect in order to for the most people to see the anomaly they're looking at. But it's more than one anomaly to look at, but some people can only see the one. But some people can see two and some people can see a hundred. This depends on your um, natural 
talents and abilities um, and how you interpret information that you can make it understandable by other people in the same um, paradigm as you. So over here in America, we have an, uh, a resurgence of realization that the ones they call African-Americans was already here even though we intermingled and mixed with Africans long before Columbus came, it wasn't until after the Columbus um, contact that we ever have something known as a slave system or doctrine of who we are. We didn't have that. We knew who we was before, before Columbus came, but after 1492 and many years of war, we end up being told that we were somebody other than we was by the society, which is ran by a corporation masquerading as a government. Yeah, well, you know, um, you always wonder like it's the Moors that helped helped them get out get out to um, into the Americas anyway, and um, he didn't actually come to America, Columbus. It was the Caribbean. In the Caribbean. Yeah, he, he landed in uh in uh Hispaniola, which today is called uh I think it's Dominica Haiti. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So he basically when he when they came and the story that we get told that he slaughtered, you know, he slaughtered the um indigenous peoples. Now when we say indigenous peoples, from their perspective, is it's it's uh, the Eskimo Mongoloid type people. That's how they refer to it. The red man, or what they want to call, you know, they have various different names, don't they? Eskimo, red man, you know. And, but now, when we're dealing with things like the Olmecs, we can clearly see the African presence in the Americas way before, far the year before Columbus. Also, people like um, Abba Bukhari taking voyages from Mali, you know. So there's many different, and that's just. That's just two migrations. There's many, many more. The people in the Pacific Islands came over as well. So I'm quite aware of different people coming into the Americas. Now, as far as um, what you just mentioned then about, do you, because I've heard different things what different people say. Some people say black folks have always been in America. And um, some say no. Some to see that the transatlantic slave trade. Some even see the transatlantic slave trade as a myth. Listen to some of the Moorish teachings. Um, so where do, where would you say you stand on it um, as far as the Africans reaching America? We was doing business on the eastern shoreboards of North and South America with tribes in Africa and intermarrying into royal families from Africa the whole time we've been here, the whole time we've been in communication, but the the communication was severed through the um, crusades of the Admiralty fleets. The Admiralty fleets was developed as the um, Moors was being exiled from Europe. <laughs> the first place they went when they got exiled is in northwestern Africa called Al Maghrib. When they went there, they couldn't stay there because they already been kicked out from over there. They have to find somewhere else to go. The Pope gave them the discovery doctrine, which commissioned them to conquer lands where other people was already inhabiting under the pretense that if they were not Judeo-Christians, they was not civilized. So because they not civilized, they incurred something called the white man's burden. The white man's burden was popularized in a poem by Rudyard Kipling about the Christian right to convert the pagans to the church. This was done under Constantine in the Nicene Council. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, most of us who sleep on is that the Old Testament was written after the New Testament because they needed a backstory to justify the fallacy of the first story. Yeah. And then Islam was created by Catholic priests in order to 
um, figure out how to corral in using the principles of sociology to control the nature of the people from the land and the fire or of the Chaldees. So they need to figure out these hostile warring tribes, how do we get them all under one control measure and they produce Islam as that measure? But Islam was stolen from the ancient worship of Alat that was common to the people of the land. And this is what made them use Islam and change Alat to a male to push the male so chauvinist agenda and the um, disenfranchisement of women under the doctrine of religion. Yeah, the patrilineal system, patriarchy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Very interesting because it's funny how you mentioned mentioned about like um the time of 325 AD, um Constantine. And so during this time now, say before we before this, the conference of Nicaea, before this. So wh what did you see as the beginning of um, these religions? Now I understand spirituality has been here for way longer and it's comp I wouldn't compare spirituality with religion, but as far as these religions, like what you call the Hebrews, um, well, the Torah, what where did you find the beginning of all this? The traces are straight back to Babylon. Babylon. Traces straight back because before you had the Bible, before you had a New Testament, the Old Testament, you had the Talmud and the Mush Mishnah. The Talmud and the Mishnah was the text that the priest that was known as Hebrew priest at the time brought out of Babylon with them. Included in those documents, you will read the human sacrifice rituals, you will read the money uh, magic rituals, and you will read the sex magic rituals. Right? So it was three forms of conjure <laughs> that they used to conquer the world. And it's Babylonian blood magic, Babylonian sex magic, and Babylonian money magic. Now, Babylon when is uh, modern-day Iraq, as we're speaking on Babylon, modern-day yeah. Iraq. Now, just before yeah. Babylon, we're dealing with Mesopotamia and S Samaria. Yeah. So Samaria, what I was aware of is that um, it was a black civilization, and um, supposedly they came from other places like Kemet, you know, or, or Kush around these places. So now sometimes people deal with this area, the Sumerians, as being the oldest civilization. Then I've had people like, have you heard of Dr. Renok Rashidi? Yeah. Now I've had him on my show, I've met up with him. I, he came over to my city, I put on the event for them. Now one question I did ask him, I remember, whose civilization is older, Sumeria or Egypt? Now he says it was caught, you know, from his research, it's definitely Egypt, and then obviously you can go before the Egypt, you have Nubia and other parts of Africa. But um, now some people use as Samaria being older. Now, either way, they're both black civilizations, that's the main thing. So from your research, do you find like Egypt older than Samaria or Samaria older than Egypt? Or well, as we call it, Kemet? Egypt, first you got to know who founded Egypt. Okay. And then you need to know who founded Sumer. Okay. If you don't know who the founding originators was of those societies, we pick up on what we call pre-dynastic Egypt. Yeah. Thousands of years into their existence, right? Contemporary with Sumer. The oldest document that tells us about the origin of ancient Egypt is the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. Many people think they're mythical teachings and that they're not real, but the information in there is undisputably accurate. Yeah. Right? But it's not accepted by modern academia as an actual document to um, date history. Because if they did, this would put um, the arrival of Tahuti from the Americas in Egypt long before the, f the first of the dynasties and 
the majority of the pre-dynastic pre kings. In pre-dynastic Egypt, we forget there was kings that was ruling for 35 and 45,000 years. Yeah. But in under the dynastic periods, they are the longest reigning, I think, was Ramses, which was like 81 years or something like that. Yeah. You see, so <clears throat> what are we looking at? We looking at somebody's trying to control the narrative and anything that's belligerent to the narrative given is wrote off as fanciful, mythological, and far-fetching and far-reaching for the truth. But as soon as you start comparing the information in the document to the settlement, it starts to match up so accurately that you like, we can't just toss this out. That's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, well, interesting to me, because like, you know, I'm aware like Nubia is older than um, Kemet. And also um, people like Dr. Ben Yoshi, Ben Yakinen, speaking on the, um, the Egyptians spoke that they came from the beginning of the Nile.